Kevin Harrington, the original shark, many other things. We're going to talk about uh, the whole Shark Tank thing, but um, I appreciate you giving us a little time, Kevin, sitting down with us. It's great to be here, it's Dave. Great Thanks. To have you. Thanks. And uh, before we get into the Shark Tank and all the questions everybody wants to know, you've been dubbed as the inventor of the infomercial. I know that you launched your first one over like 30 years ago. Yes. But how has that business changed, especially with the introduction of um, technology, social media, M commerce, all that? Has yes. It much? So, yeah, absolutely. So, 30 years ago, how it started, I, I saw bars on the screen <laughs> on TV, and I called the cable company and asked why didn't they have programming there? And they said because they couldn't afford all the programming <laughs> at those late night hours. So, I started programming with products. And so I, I said, um, I'll give you the Jack LaLanne juicer and the Tony Little Gazelle and the George Foreman cleaning products and whatever else, right? Or grill. Yeah. So, um, so that's how that started. But now, since then, the, the viewership, the audience viewership is down 50% in the last 12 years. Wow. So what's happened is, why are people not watching TV? They're watching their computer. They're watching their mobile phone. Right. You mentioned them, commerce. That's really what's happening. So, um, so now the TV stations are still generating similar revenues, but there's half the viewers. Sure. So TV isn't working near as well. So now you have to incorporate into your, your campaigns the other kinds of commerce. And we say the other channels of distribution. Yeah. And I know you've launched over 500 products. I think it was like over 20 went to like 100 million in revenue, which is mind-boggling. Uh, how do you focus on all that? I'm sure some of them are launched at the same time. So there's a saying in business, if you chase two rabbits, you don't get either. How do you not split your focus, or do you have people in, involved with each separate yes. product? Yes, so, so we actually, we had at one time, we, were, we had a fishing infomercial that was yeah. rolling out, and we had a, uh, that was called the Flying Lure. Then we had a golf infomercial called the Medicus Golf Club. And then we had a, a fitness infomercial with Tony Little. So at one time, we were running fitness, golf, and um, uh, fishing all at once. Now, you're in three different industries. So you have teams of people that are doing all that, you know, all that kind of distribution. So the, a lot of the same functions happen on the media buy. So you're buying media, taking phone calls, shipping product. That's all one entity. But then you have kind of satellite teams sure. that focus on the specific niche industry that you're in. So it actually wasn't that tough um, because the core business was finding products, producing shows, and buying media, shipping product. And then we had satellite teams that would help in the retail and, and, and global distribution. Unbelievable. Well, I, I started as a, as a young entrepreneur, 19. I read that you had started, was it a, a driveway company when you were like 15? And then yeah. when you were in college, it was like a heating and air. Yes. Um, and eventually, I, I think it became so successful, you decided to kind of follow that and kind of drop out of the college route. Yes. Uh, as we know, when you first start in business, you have some naysayers of like, get a real job, and they're you know, security driven. Was it hard for you to kind of pull the trigger and say, well, I'm uh, going to go for it? Me, or did my you have my mother was the first one that was the naysayer, <laughs> okay? My mother was very upset because I'm one of six kids. My, my oldest sister was a school teacher and graduated summa cum laude from college. And then my next uh, sister, older sister, was a school teacher. One married a doctor, one married a lawyer. My brother was a corporate executive for Gillette. I came, along. <laughs> yeah, I came along and I said, I'm sealing driveways and doing air conditioning systems and quit school. So, but I knew that wasn't what I wanted to do the rest of my life. What I wanted to do was own my own business yeah. and control my own destiny. So. Um, my mother, while she was upset, it took her a few years, but then she understood because uh, there, you have a passion and you have a, a, a place that I think you're meant to be. And, and for me, it was controlling my own destiny. I couldn't sit and work for somebody else yeah. like the rest of my family yeah, had sure. done. Well, you certainly have done a great job controlling your own destiny. And I have to imagine that you've become kind of like that guy now. I mean, you're the guy that has the recipe for you know, uh, taking an idea and making it into this multi-million dollar product or company, uh, is it kind of like everywhere you go, people are like, hey man, let's grab lunch. Uh, and then, uh, by the way, uh, I know I was telling one of my guys on the way up here that there was a time where uh, I, I was working on business plans. I would help people facilitate funding. And I kind of got that niche. 
And it was a good thing and a bad thing because we would get invited out. Specifically, one time we got invited to dinner, and I told my wife, "Baby, we got to go out. We're gonna." I don't know. It's not going to be anything about business. It's just a social. Which they, as soon yeah. as we got out there, we have dinner. Everything was great. And yeah. they said, well, let's move into the family room where we'll be more comfortable. Right. <laughs> when I'm going to sit, I thought I saw a projector. But when right. I sat down, I turned the whole wall with the business. There, room. Yeah. But do you kind yes. of get that? It's like everywhere you, know, you go, there's uh, some pins. You know, just walking into to our production today, the, the guy valley parking my car, he says, are you that guy from Shark Tank? Oh. You know? And so... When it really gets bad is when it's when it's the masseuse that's you're you're going in to get a massage because you need to sure. get a break, right? When the masseuse is trying to pitch you a product, right? Sure. So no, but I'll say this: um, I've taken over fifty thousand pitches in the last thirty years, and that's my business. So now there's a time and a place for it. My wife gets upset if we're having dinner and sure. somebody is is trying to do that, but. Um, I always take a card. I always get a phone number. I always return a call yeah. and and make sure that I um, can at least get somebody sure. to help me take a look at the project because it, the day that that stops happening is the day I'm out of business, yeah, right? right? So I, I still enjoy yeah. um, hearing from people. It's just not 24-7. Sure, you need a little a break in the action, Absolutely. right? Yeah. I, I know that is. And, uh, of course, after the interview, I want to talk to you about something, but uh, no. <laughs> but uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I do want to talk a little bit about Shark Tank and some of the other things uh, that you're involved in. Stick with us. We'll be right back with Kevin Harrington. Don't go anywhere. Okay, we're back with Kevin Harrington. Kevin, I have to ask you, recently I read an article in Forbes magazine, re just a month or two. It was talking about uh, uh, things, finding the right investor and things you can do to acquire funds for your right. idea. Uh, I know one thing you talked about is really finding out what their interests are before you just go pitch. Right. But uh, for those that didn't read the article, and you should go read the article, uh, what are some other keys or, or key factors to, to acquiring funding or getting some, your product launched? So there's, there's several things. I, I have, um, I say there's 10 investor sweet spots um, because some people, like and you don't have to have all ten of these for any one investor. Sure. Sometimes it could just be one thing that will get the investor excited. So some like to hear about patents or intellectual property, yeah. whether you have some ownership of something unique. Others like to see, like in the case of an Instagram, um, massive quick growth. Yeah. They don't care about profits. So if you're talking to an investor that wants to see quick growth, he doesn't actually would prefer not to see profits because then he's thinking you're leaving money on the table that you could have invested back into the growth of the company. Yeah. Um, but other investors, if you don't have profits, they're, they're not even going to pay any attention to the deal. So you have to key in on what is the sweet spot of the investor. That, that's number one. S secondly, you've got to put together a great business plan and an elevator pitch in your business plan because I get dozens and dozens a week of proposals yeah. and if, if I get something that's 45 pages long and it takes me 30 minutes to get into it to yeah. figure out what it is I, I just don't have time for it so sure. you have to know how to write a good business plan and um, and with an executive summary and and then um, one of the key things that I look for now and I learned this the hard way from Shark Tank uh, I made some investments on Shark Tank where I bought the entrepreneur and I invested in that, that you know, they, they say the, the jockey, right? Yeah. Well, they didn't have a team. And so they went through, one lady went through $500,000 in six months because it was just her. She had no advisors, nobody around her to help her. So yeah. it was a bad deal for me. Yeah. I won't invest anymore unless there's a team. I, sure. I want to see an advisory board, a strong Board of Advisors, Board of Directors, people that have financial skills, operational skills, in addition to the entrepreneurial skills, yeah, sure. okay? So, so you know, when you start thinking about how do you stack the deck in your favor if you're raising capital, you know, I've joined, I'm on about more than 15 boards and, and, and advisory boards myself. So, I've helped companies that you know, I, I helped a small little startup out of out of uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, <laughs> raise a million dollars in cash, take off and go to the moon. You know, yeah, sure. um, another company I joined about two years ago was at about five million in sales. They're now at about 50 million in sales. They're in 28,000 retail outlets. So get somebody that can help you that has a vision, yeah. that has a track record to be part of your team. Now, 
I did those deals. I didn't have to own huge equity. I just sure. I got an advisory position, a sure. little bit of stock, you know, a little um, compensation package sure. type of thing. That's part of what I enjoy doing. Yeah. But there's a lot of people that are like this in, in out of the marketplace. I utilize them for my deals. So if I'm raising capital, I put a good team together, I put a good pitch together, I put a good business plan together, a good executive summary, and if you have all of those elements, you're going to likely raise the capital. Sure. And obviously you were immensely successful before Shark Tank. I think it's safe to say though Shark Tank uh, definitely uh, expanded the, the, the notoriety and the, uh, to the public view. Uh, what was it like, the experience in general, of being on, on Shark Tank? And Shark Tank was, was a great experience because, number one, um, it's a hit show on ABC Network, so it's seen by 20 million people every week. So um, it, is, it, it, it put me into a position to be able to get tremendous uh, deal flow. And, and, and any business person, one of the things you look for is how do you build your funnel, gotcha. right? Okay, so your funnel is it starts here, load it up, and then it's, you know, you have a, yeah. I call it a hopper, and down at the bottom you spit good ones out, right? right. But you have all this due diligence that has to happen here. So, so it wasn't, the deals that I did on Shark Tank weren't the great situations for sure. me as an investor. Those were okay, and I made some money on a few of those. I mean, this is a jewelry company that I bought, Aldo Orta Jewelry, for example. A couple other deals that, did, that did, did very well, right? But it was the, the deal flow that yeah. came to me because I was sure. on the show, and, um, and that was very, very exciting. And that is, it continues, you know, this is now, I shot the, I got the call in 2008 from Mark Burnett, I shot the pilot in 2009. Here we are almost going into 2015. I've been involved with this brand for seven years, yeah. so it's, it's been a really nice run. Well, certainly you brought a lot of value to the show, but I'm sure, as you mentioned, you've gleaned a lot, I'm sure, from the, the experience of the show, seeing so sure. many people learning, oh, don't invest in a, a one-man band. or um, Exactly. Well, certainly. Uh, what about, uh, do you still have some JVs with some of the guys on Shark Tank? What was it like working with yeah. them? I mean, um, O'Leary and, and myself uh, go on a tour together here and there. Um, O'Leary? Um, O'Leary, yeah. Like a wild man just you know hanging what, out with him. You know what I say? <laughs> why does he call himself Mr. Wonderful? Because nobody else will, okay? Yeah. <laughs> All right? That's, that's Mr. Wonderful. He's a funny guy, actually. Yeah. Um, he loves guitars. He and I did the National Association of Music uh, Manufacturer show. Then we were at a, another, uh, the, the, um, um, the, the um, uh, it was uh, the uh, direct response marketing show down in San Diego. So he would go on stage, I would go on stage. I do the same thing with Damon John, with yeah. Barbara Corcoran, with uh, Robert Hertzvik. We we all kind of work together and, and run around. So there's actually there were ten sharks. Um, uh, I don't know if you knew Jeff Foxworthy yeah. was a shark, and then mm -hmm. um, John Paul DeGiorgio was a shark, and and um, um, one of the Tish brothers was a shark. So it, it's it, there's been a, a, some really cool sharks that have that have come out of the the show, and some big deals, some you know some pretty good successes. So what, what are some of the big uh, mistakes that you've seen? Uh, on the show. I, I, I know I've seen episodes so many times where somebody's saying, you know, we're going to do, I, I, we need $200 or 200000 in equity, we're going to give 10%. And so you're like, okay, so currently you're evaluating your company at $2 million. Uh, what do you have in sales right now? $15,000. Right. Wait a minute. Yeah. Probably the first thing people make a big mistake on is their valuation. Uh, the second thing they make their, uh, they make a big mistake on, they only think about themselves and they think that it's me, me, me. They're, you know, I don't like to say it this way, but sometimes they're very greedy about what they want. But really what they have to do is convince the shark to write a check. Yeah, so yeah. you have to think, what is it that will make the shark make the investment? It has to be exciting to the shark. Yeah. Um, so it, what I try to do, because I raise capital for projects that I get involved with, right? So uh, if I need, if uh, I've got a project, I needed $20 million for the company. I put the first million in, and then I went and raised $19 million. We actually raised $22 million. So we raised $21 million on top of the first million. But I, I look at, try, how do I accelerate a yeah. payback back to the investor? Yeah, sure. And so, so I, if, if it's going to take five or ten years to get my money back, I'm not interested. Yeah. I want to see a, a payback in 18 months to three years, yeah. me as an individual investor. So I focus on the investor and getting the investor, making the investor yeah. happy. And that is a big thing that a lot of people never think about. Real key, the investors first. 
Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about how you personally vet risk and also some of the projects that you're working on now. Uh, more with Kevin Harrington in a minute. Don't go anywhere. Now, I wanted to get to these. So knowing that I was going to come on and do the interview, we had a lot of fan mail come in, a lot of people from the viewers saying, ask them this, ask them that. So I wanted to see if we could work in a few of these questions from fans. Uh, we have a question here from Caleb uh, Yonts from Alabama. He says, uh, what was the lowest point in your life or fail that you've experienced? How did you come back? How did it push you? And you know, what did you learn from it? The lowest point in, in, in my business career was I, got, I had a business that was going like this in sales, but we ran out of capital. And so we ended up almost losing the whole company. And um, it was, it, it, we got right down to, to the, the you know, bare bones, uh, almost just walk out the door and, and throw the keys in, even though we were still actually selling products. So we didn't plan properly for finances. Sure. And in hindsight, um, after that event, I ended up bringing on a bank president to help me run the business because I was very good with getting the deals and getting uh, the products and getting the shows and getting the sales. But if you don't have the right operations and finance people involved with you, you can lose the whole business. Sure, so, sure. so that was a pretty, uh, a pretty major event, but it taught me to, to not let that happen again. Well, one thing I've noticed too in the public eye, you're very transparent. You're very open about things, and, which I really appreciate. So many people are afraid to talk about their failures. But man, if you get up to bat and hit a home run every time, you don't learn much. When you take those hard failures, that's when you really evaluate things and refine, tweak, and move forward. And those are the big lessons uh, yes. for sure. Uh, we have another one from Dr. Samantha Graver in Florida. Uh, this is kind of a, bear with me here. If you were designing the ultimate entrepreneur, you were designing it, what elements would you be sure to include? And is there any for sure you'd want to leave out? Okay. So I think... Probably, if it sounds like if this is almost like a robot entrepreneur, yeah, yeah. right? Would it would be have tons of of uh, energy and and time, you know, sure. the, every day to be able to do whatever it takes, right? But I would say um, it, it's very important in entrepreneurship to be uh, good in sales, sure. to be good in selling yourself, selling your business, selling the vision, selling the dream. Uh, you can get good people. The, to come along with you. You can get financing if, if you can talk the bankers and the investors to come along with you. Um, and then um, you can also then surround yourself with the right team because it, as an entrepreneur, unless it is a robot that is, is not a human, yeah. you can't have all the skills, right. okay? So um, I think you know, if you could have all the skills and you, you could design this robot that's the, you know, the perfect entrepreneur, it would be one that has operational skills, financial skills, entrepreneurial skills, and sales skills, everything across the board equal, that probably doesn't exist, right? So um, I think that it's it, it, it probably the best thing that I could say that a good entrepreneur should have is the ability to assemble all of that and well, package it, bring, right, it right bring it all together, package it, and then raise the capital around sure. it. Because if you can get the team and the money for any vision, then you can build any business. That's, right. that, that's what you need. Yeah, and I think one of the elements to leave out, I know personally what I've experienced is ego, man. I mean, yeah. some of these guys come in with so much ego, it just kills deals, it makes everything slow. Uh, yes. I even see people on Shark Tank try to leverage you guys. <laughs> yes. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah. You can't leverage us. <laughs> Uh, we have yeah. another uh, question here from, uh, uh, let's see here, Trevor Barfield from Missouri, a uh, nine-year-old, big fan. Oh, wow. Uh, he says, uh, why do you make your first, uh, when did you, why did you make your first infomercial and how did you become so successful with it? Okay. So the, the first infomercial was actually, I, I saw bars on the screen on my TV and I called and found out that uh, they just don't have enough programming to put in there. So I'm like, you know. At midnight, the the channels would go dark, and and they would have either when I say dark, you know, test bars. And so I said, I'll give you something to put there. I'll find a product, and I'm going to put it right on there. So we started shooting videos sure. around these products, and that was how it all started back in the the early '80s. Yeah. Um, so th that um, has been a big part of 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 the success. But I didn't stop in just the U.S. I then took it to. I took it to England, I took yep. it to Saudi Arabia, I took it to Expanding Japan. So you always have to be, you know, 
to the point, I think it was Trevor that asked, you know, how did it, that become so successful after just doing one infomercial? It's because I didn't stop with one infomercial. I didn't stop with one category. I went from golf to fishing to beauty to fitness, uh, crafts, hardware, et cetera, and then we went global with it. So yeah. you have to always be looking for the next uh, opportunity, and, and, sure. and, that, and, sure. and that's the kind of thing that I like to do is just to keep plugging along. Keep plugging. Yeah. Uh, last one for fans, Chris L.O.R. from... Um I don't know where he's from. He's all over the place. Uh, talking about uh, investing in yourself. I know when I interviewed Brian Tracy, he talked about um, you know the biggest investment you can make is an investment in yourself. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, what is the biggest investment you've made in yourself? I think um, my wife uh, has. She, when when I hi I hire coaches, I hire mentors, and and I say hire. Sometimes I don't have to pay. Um, but I generally like to because I, if, I, if you ask for something for nothing, sometimes you don't get much back in return. So I, I hire coaches to coach me in the areas that I need help in. Uh, and so my wife says, I, don't can't, I can't believe that you're spending money with somebody to do such and such. And I'm like, but I'm taking my game to another yeah, level. That's not my will. Yeah, I'm yeah. Good at so, that, yeah. So, you know, it, and, and so... I believe in mentors and coaches, sure. and I have, you know, a half a dozen right now that I utilize. So, um, because I... Mr. I, Wonderful's not yeah, one of them. And Mr. Wonderful <laughs> is not one of them now. Okay? So, it, uh, I, it, that to me, yeah. it, an entrepreneur has to know where they're strong and then where they need help. Yeah. And, and, and I'll be the first to admit, and by the way, this wasn't until probably recently after taking a lot of hard knocks for making a lot of bad decisions. And by the way, I have failed more than I've succeeded. Sure. So uh, Winston Churchill says it best. It, success is being able to go from failure to failure without the loss of enthusiasm. Yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> you know, so I, I, it's hard to be enthused when you fail, but I, get, I say fail fast and fail cheap and then get on to the big ones. You know? right. So um, I, I love having people help me and support me in, in my goals, and uh, I think that's important. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. We appreciate it. Stick with us. We'll be right back with Kevin Harrington. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. We've been talking with Kevin Harrington. Uh, we've been talking about uh, how to vet risk and some of the mistakes people make going into the tank. Uh, and certainly as investors, we all have things that we do personally to uh, vet risk, and we're looking for a certain risk-reward ratio. Nothing's no risk, you know, all one scenario. Right. But I'm sure uh, with all the deals in Shark Tank and even after, um, not everything's a home run. Sometimes you're going to get something that just falls flat. Uh, in those scenarios, which I'm sure all of us have had, uh, what do you do? Do you, do you keep saying, you know, just keep changing the strategy until it works, or sometimes do you get to that point with some things where you just have to say, it's time to cut my losses and just I got to walk away and be unemotional? Y yes, you, you, uh, interesting for me, some of the things I lost the most money on were my own projects that I got so close to. Sure. And so I like to, I don't like to do my own projects anymore because <laughs> be, uh, you get emotionally attached and you yeah. just keep throwing money into these projects. So um, as an investor, you have to set up parameters that sure. you need to get to a certain point by a certain time. Now, if, if you don't get there, you might have to allow for a little bit of tweaking. But, um, you know, at, at certain times, you just have to pull the plug or change the deal completely because um, you might have to change equity structures, if, yeah. especially, this is one of the things that a lot of people that come on Shark Tank don't realize. Let's say you do a deal where I am a minority partner and I own 20% and they own 80 yeah. and now we need more capital. Sure. Well, they don't realize that they have to contribute more capital because they own the majority of the business. So <laughs> now if you want to change the deal, I'll put, I'll put all the money in, but not if I still only own 20%. So. Um, but yes, as far as vetting goes, um, I like opportunities that have, I, I call it test before you invest, meaning I want to see that there's something that there's a, a pulse on something or a business that maybe they can get orders or they have orders, but um, they don't have the capital. Sure. So that's a safer investment than a complete startup that might never get off the ground because I mean, startups are very, very risky. So. I prefer to put money into, in, even when I look at a product for an infomercial, if it's been in a catalog, if it's been on a shopping channel, if it's, you know, I, I like to say, test before I yeah. invest. So now, 
It's, t it's tested successful somewhere. Now it needs capital to roll it out. That's a much safer investment than, I got this idea, will you fund the development right. and the tooling and the manufacturing? I have an and, idea. Make it a company. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So, you know, it's, there's different things that I look for yeah, in sure. a vetting process. Well, we've talked a lot about success, and obviously you've had your share of it. Uh, but as we all know, starting out as entrepreneurs, there's a real grind in the beginning. You've got to go out there and pound pavement. It's not an easy thing. People look at the end result, I'm sure, of where you are now and say, oh, man, I want to do that. But there's a time where you're experiencing a lot of pain and discomfort. You're, get, you're taking your share of nosebleeds. Talk a little bit about the early days of some of the things, some of the grind. I know I, uh, Mark Cuban talks about eating ketchup sandwiches. I remember being evicted yes. several times myself, taking some risks. Sure. Well, in, in the early days of infomercials, we didn't know what categories worked, what products worked. Sure. So we would try things and and not knowing whether they were going to be successful. So, um, Back you know, then, you're beta testing the whole We're beta testing every, every category. Yeah. So uh, beauty turned out to be great because of the continuity sure. aspect, right? Um, fitness turned out to be great because people, they want, America wants to lose weight yeah. and they want to get into shape, but because they generally don't, they're always going to be open for another fitness product down the road. Golf turned out to be very tough because it's, it's a smaller marketplace. You know, if you're selling a kitchen product, like the Ginsu knives that I was involved yeah, with, sure. um, everybody's got a kitchen. Yeah. Everybody needs a knife, to, you know, at some point or another, right? But not everybody, not everybody needs a golf club or, um, you know, uh, a, 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 a special kind of tea or something, right? Yeah. So, so golf and fishing became a little more niched, um, not, but not undoable. Just, you know, you have to know how to go about sure. those kind of products. So, so yes, we, um, we went through many learning curves uh, and, and ended up with, with being the, you know, the pioneers getting yeah. blood run down our ankles from testing things that had no chance for success along yeah. the way. Being first is nice, but sometimes being first has its uh, pains too. Right. Uh, now, I want to talk about a few of the things you're doing. I saw that you were actually served as a judge on the uh, USF Young uh, Inventors uh, Innovators Competition. Correct. Uh, working with children in the Tampa uh, area pitch products. Yes. Uh, how important is it, what does it mean to you to work with these young kids and help them and really give back? I, I was involved, actually was one of the founders of the Young Entrepreneurs Organization, which became the Entrepreneurs Organization. Um, and, and then I do a lot of things with colleges. Even we go into grade schools, it's a little tougher to go down into the, into the grade schools. We get into like the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade though, these kids are starting to come up with great ideas. So I like to empower inventors, entrepreneurs across the board. Yeah. Uh, just this weekend, I was involved with the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization. They have 200 chapters, 200 colleges around the U.S. So I donate my time and, and, and really mentor and, and roll up my sleeves. And like I love working with the youth in America because this is, is the, this is where the, the next round of projects are going to be coming from for me down the road. Yeah. So um, it's, it's sort of planting the seeds today and, and empowering them because so many people, when I grew up, my mother was like, no, I don't want you to be an entrepreneur. I don't want you yeah. to be an inventor. And that was sort of the, the, this is 40 years ago, right? Today, I think it's a little more acceptable to be an entrepreneur. So, so I'm there to, to be a, a, a cheerleader for, the, for these young entrepreneurs, and, well, I, and I, I love doing it. We, we live in, especially our country, we live in this place where you go out, you get a degree, you go out and beg for jobs. Instead of the mindset of maybe I can go create my own job and maybe create jobs for others, and I think that that shift has to happen young. You've got to start young teaching people financial principles, taking risk, things like that. So. My father was an entrepreneur, and I've learned a lot from him. I worked um, prior to my own businesses when I was 11 years old. I worked in his restaurants yeah. and, and just learned quite a bit about what it was like to be an entrepreneur. And, and I saw the tough work that he did, but then I saw the, the, the fruits of that, and that's what I wanted to, to, to have for myself. I know you attribute him to one of your personal heroes. Uh, you also created a really amazing association called the uh, the EO, which you talked about on right. the newer organization. Now, this has over 10,000 members. There's like 46 countries that it's in, or so. Uh, it's got a combined gross revenue of like 500 billion. Could that even be? Y yeah. I can't comprehend that. Uh, what are the qualifications to get into the? the EO and um, where do you think it's heading? EO, um, we, when we, we first got it started, we, we, we actually said you 
couldn't be over 40, now it's over 50, but you have to have a business that does at least a million dollars a year in business. And um, that is a qualification that they, they want substantial entrepreneurs. They don't want people that just want to be an entrepreneur. If you have a business doing a million dollars in sales, you're an entrepreneur. Sure. So that's the qualification. And um, you have to be committed to going to regular meetings and, and events. And there's things happening on a monthly basis. And okay. there's global opportunities also. But EO is a, is a really fine organization, tremendous people. I was just yesterday in Orlando with the former uh, a managing director of EO two years ago, Kevin Langley, who lives down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and he's just an amazing. The networking and the people and the knowledge that they bring to the table for you as an entrepreneur is, is, is just unbelievable. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I, I know that, um, so it's really not just a matter of, you know, hey, I have an idea, I want to be, it, they got to have some value. They got to really uh, have something that they bring to the table. Yeah. Now, your book, Act Now, uh, how to Turn Ideas into Multi-Million Dollar Products came out a couple of years ago. I actually picked it up. I've actually gleaned a lot from it. Can you tell us a little bit about what's next uh, as far as projects that you're working on? Or Yes, my next project, because I mentioned television viewership is, um, is, is declining. It's off 50% in 12 years. Darn it. Always. Okay. Now, where we, where's it moving? Yeah. It's, it's, it's moving towards mobile. And so I cut a deal with Sprint. Um, and I'm launching the first ever mobile shopping channel, and it's called Star Shop. And it's going to launch in the first quarter next year. And this is a celebrity-based shopping channel that every day you're, we're going to be push notifying you with opportunities from celebrity products. Um, we have Adam Levine, Nicki Minaj, Jennifer Lopez, uh, uh, Sofia Vergaro, some really top celebrities. We're yeah. selling their products, their jewelry, their perfumes, their clothing, fashion, beauty, everything across the board from celebrities. And um, Sprint is my partner. They're going to preload this app on every Sprint phone. Wow. So it's a really cool project. Amazing. You know, for the, for the entrepreneurs watching, uh, thinking, you know, I want to go out there and I want a uh, career in TV or I, I have an idea, I want to take my idea. Any advice that you can give to our viewers about getting started and getting in the pool? The, the, the one thing that I say is a lot of people don't, they think that it's just going to hit them somewhere, like yeah. at, if, at work or at home or whatever. You have to get out. And I ask, uh, every time I speak, I say, how many people here go to more than two or three trade shows a year? And it's generally only a couple of hands out of hundreds. Out of 500 people, maybe five hands. I do 35 trade shows a year. Why? Because I'm out looking for opportunities. I'm building my funnel. And um, that's where I get my deals. And, you know, and, uh, and also coming from Shark Tank, yes, I get a couple phone calls. But, but <laughs> if, if, if I don't keep pounding the streets, you yeah. have to go out. I go to Chamber of Commerce meetings. I go to uh, networkings. I, I, I go to trade shows. And so when I do this, I, I meet people, I interact, and I build my funnel, and then I look at the opportunities right. that come from that. So be curious. Uh, put your mind into, I say, curiosity overload, and, 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 and projects are going to come your way. And then you can pick between, you've got, if you've got 10 things to look at and you only want to do one, now you've got 10 to analyze before you can pick the that's really right. one that's best for you. That's so right. otherwise, most people, they, they, they don't have even one to look at. So you've got to build your funnel, and that's the key thing. That's right. And be relentless, right? Get yes. Get out there. Don't quit. I know most people give up five minutes before the miracle. But you're certainly one of those guys that didn't do it, and you've made such an impact on millions of people. Uh, I could sit here and talk to you all day. We're out of time, Kevin. But thank you so much for giving us a, a bit of your time. Dan, it's been a pleasure. Uh, that's our show, guys. And I uh, hope you enjoyed the interview with Kevin Harrington. And uh, again, as always, don't forget to get involved in your local community and be forgiving of others. Good night, everybody.
Hi, I'm Dan Vega, and thank you for watching our channel. I want to take a second to tell you about a resource that's helping thousands of people across the country, Blue University. Blue University is the premier online business school for entrepreneurs and business leaders. You know, if you find yourself in a day-to-day -day grind where you've lost your joy or you're just tired of struggling, then check out blue.university. That's B-L-U dot university. I can promise that you receive nothing short of a multi-million dollar education. And if you want a completely different life in three to six months and a way to create wealth in five years or less, then again, check it out. That's blu.university. Find out why blue is the new color of success. Also, make sure to subscribe to this channel or to give us a good rating, but that's only if you see value. And when you do receive value, make sure to share it with someone else. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.